Yes, we're starting. All right, thanks everyone for coming. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So my name's Eleanor Collar, I'm a Research Relationships Manager for UNE Library. My colleague Berenice Scott and I have helped to organise this event. In terms of housekeeping, the toilets were kind of more towards the entrance when you came in. If there's a fire or an emergency, just leave, I guess, is generally <laughs> what I do. Um, yeah, we have afternoon tea at 3 till 3.30, and these are kind of drop-in sessions, a few breakout sessions, etc. So just come and go as you feel free to. Uh, and now our university librarian, Blanca Bizzani, will say a few words. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for the kind welcome. And um, I'm really delighted to be here. This is the furthest south I've come by car from Brisbane since I moved to Australia. <laughs> I've been, to, I've been as far as uh, Glen Innes before, um, and I came prepared with my beanie, so I'm, you know, I'm ready for any, anything the weather can throw at me. Um, it's really great to be here. UNE is one of our um, the newest members, and we're really delighted to have um, expanded our membership uh, this year. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the group. First, first thing to say is um, I'm really happy to take questions as we go through, so feel free to you know, stand up, shout at me, wave, wave, ask a question. That includes from any folk online. Um, my slides will obviously be available afterwards. You're welcome to use them in any way that you think that's useful. We're gonna, I'm going to do three sessions this afternoon. So the first one is going to be a general one on open access. The second one is about publishing open access. And then after the break, I hope this doesn't scare you off. This is going to, it's going to be more interactive and it's about advocacy and thinking about advocacy um, and how you, um, how you might want to um, be, how you might, what messages you want to take out. And that can include perhaps for yourself and your peers and, um, and strategies for doing that. So that's going to be a hands-on part. Um, all right, I'm going to start sharing the screen. So I'm going to start actually with uh, something kind of funny that happened, uh, happened to me yesterday. So um, actually, I had two things that happened yesterday, which were, which were great fun. Um, so folk online, can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So the first, the first thing I did yesterday, which was really great fun, was actually I went to a graduation of one of the PhD students at QUT who I was a mentor to. And actually, I was really inspired by something that Jonathan, um, your your you, Pro Vice Chancellor, yes. For I heard him talk about um, graduates at UNE and how many of them, you know, were he, he goes to all of these um, these these graduation ceremonies and you know it's often women. It's often women for, who are later in their careers marching across a, a stage, often with children in tow, and then they all get given given a bachelor degree or a master. And Q2 was exactly the same yesterday. And in fact, the, the woman that I was, uh, have been a mentor to, she, um, uh, she was getting her PhD, but it was a predominance of young, very engaged people. And, open action, and the reason I mentioned her is because one of her key parts of the work that she did was on open data and its relation to open scholarship. And she's now taken that work um, and had a postdoc at Yale. And now she's at um, Johns Hopkins and she's doing fantastically well. This is a really live area of academic interest. So if there's any academics in the room, 
just think about this is actually something you might want to think about working on. But then the second thing that happened was I went to a talk at UQ in the evening. And uh, on the way back, I had this, this, this thing happen to me, which was that the, PhD, the um, Uber driver was a PhD student. And I asked him what he was doing. And he asked what I was doing. And in the 12 minutes, in fact, in the last six minutes between when we got on to what I did and getting home, I managed to cover the entirety of open access, open access publishing models. We got into the finances of Elsevier. We talked about how to be a reviewer. And then I talked about think, check, submit. And then my final parting words were, go and talk to your library if you've got any more questions. <laughs> so I sort of feel like if I can do it in six minutes, I can probably cover a fair bit in, um, in, in a couple of hours. But it was actually really interesting to try and do as a pitch. And he was, he was fantastically interested. Um, and uh, it, it was a great, great uh, sort of thing to do. And it's, there's been a lot of fun on Twitter about people talking about it. So never, never underestimate having what you need to say to the person that, you know, when, when they're there. And for many people, that's actually, you know, being in the lift with your DVCR or being in the lift with, you know, an academic you've wanted to talk to. Or, you know, if you're an academic grabbing the librarian that you've wanted to have a conversation with, you know, you've got to have your quick pitch ready to talk about it. All right. So I'll now go on to the, the actual slides themselves. So let's do a new share. All right, hopefully you're seeing, you're seeing my slides now. It should be working okay. All right, so this is going to be a, a sort of rapid um, zoom through some of the things that have been happening in open access, um, which is a massively uh, a busy area at the moment. I mean, I get slightly nervous at opening up my email every morning because it's usually, uh, the, uh, if you want to, want to fill up your email with, um, with, with what's going on, you can subscribe to a thing called the Open Access Tracking Project. And there's usually anything between three and 20 items a day uh, that are coming up as, as new um, initiatives. Some of them are re re repeats, but some of them are, um, there are a surprising number of new things. And there's been a real acceleration over the last few years. So actually what's UNE getting stuck in at this particular time is actually a really uh, good time to be thinking about it. Let me tell you a little bit about what we are before I... Um, I really... It's, um, when I took this job on, we made it priority to include New Zealand. So we have all the New Zealand universities and Toa Toa, which is the... And last year, we made a really concerted effort to expand our USC, USQ, JCU, all, all acronyms that I now know exactly where these universities are and try not to get them mixed up. But what's been really interesting to me is lots of newer members have joined. It used to be that uh, Martin Borshut is the chair at uh, UNSW. Um, before that, it was, uh, it was Judy Stocker at QUT. And the group itself was started really by Judy and Tom Cochran when he was the uh, DVC for Information and Library Sciences at QUT. Um, uh, I'm based at QUT as well as Sunday a week. We're very keen to expand our, what we do. And we really do that through collaboration in lots of different ways. So we have, we have kind of a number of arms of our activities. So advocacy is really important to us. So advocacy includes things like um, talking with government, talking with the ARC and the NH and MRC, and really raising, making open access a priority nationally. And I'll talk a little bit about how we've tried to do that in the past. Uh, we collaborate furiously with anyone that will collaborate with us, and that includes anyone in Australia or New Zealand, um, but also a lot of stuff in a lot of groups internationally, and that's been really important. So in particular, groups such as the SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, which is based in the US, and their European branch. We work with OA2020. Um, I apologize, these are all acronyms, and if you want 
developed an acronym and I've said it and you don't know what it is, wave at me. But OA 2020 is open access by 2020. Um, things such as Plan S, which I will come on to because that's probably been the biggest and um, most important development of the last year or so. Um, we talk with all of them. I'm, I'm English, you can hear I'm from the UK and um, I hadn't, I hadn't really realized about this concept of the tyranny of distance until I came here. I'm now thoroughly over people telling me how far away Australia is from Europe. It's like, I know how far away it is. I've done the flight quite a few times. Um, but the problem is bigger than that, which is that it's the time zone difference. Just trying to get on international meetings when you're in Australia, as you all, all know, is really hard, particularly if there's one in the UK, one in US and, and Australia. It's impossible to do it at a decent time. And it does mean that people, <laughs> I'm seeing furious nodding from the audience, um, it does mean that you get cut out of conversations or not automatic, or people just don't think about including you. And that is a really big problem. And one of the things I've tried to do a lot is to be on those kind of calls. So um, I'm just about to train people to not do calls at 3 a.m., but it's, um, it's kind of not working that much. We do a lot of things like raising awareness. So that includes um, writing. For the, I've got, we've got something coming out, coming out in the Medical Journal of Australia, writing for places that where people don't normally think about open access. I think that's a really important. It's so I have one that we run in Australia and one that we run in New Zealand um, that are open to anybody actually. Don't have been. Um, and in fact, this is just one plug, which is that we actually are going to be recruiting for somebody to work on developing Horses, job ad coming up and, uh, in New Zealand, and I'll come on to that. What they've been up to, um, Plan S has a big, been a big focus, um, and then drive a national approach to open scholarship in Australia. And I'll talk about how we try to do that. Okay, so um, I just thought before we start, let's just talk about what I. And this is actually on O3 forever is really important. It's really important that um, you can read, download, copy, and distribute. And I realize my red things have not successfully worked, but these are key. So it's not just free to read, but it's free to do stuff with, to reuse, distribute. So a key component for open access, say if you're working in a less developed country, might be that you can take an open access copy and print it as many times as you like. If you try to do that with your average article that is subscription, you'll end up with you know, publishers being fairly unhappy with you. But you, know, you could put it into interpretive dance. It doesn't matter. However you want to do it, you can do it. That's what open the power of open access is. There are no financial, legal, or technical barriers, so that's really important. Actually, you would think that sometimes people do try to make open access quite hard to do, which is pretty frustrating. Um, and then authors have control over their integrity of their work. So that is the licenses that are associated with it. Um, and then they have the right to be acknowledged uh, within and cited. So there are some really key parts of open access that mean that it's more than just a free to read PDF. And whenever you're thinking about it, I just encourage you to hold all those bits in your mind. And this, in its simplest, this is what it looks like. So free access is free to read a PDF, which is great, but 
open access, the key thing that makes an article different from being free and open is the Creative Commons license that's associated with it. Um, and Berenice is the, um, works on copyright and will, will be nodding furiously, I'm sure, at this because that is actually the most important thing that we try to get across. So, for example, um, I'll give what QUT has just done in its open access policy is we used to require um, a copy of the author accepted manuscript to be in the repository and free to read. We now have that, we have a requirement that it's in the repository, but also that it has a Creative Commons non-commercial license on it. And that is really important because it means the university can then do whatever what it likes with it. So, for example, it incorporate it within teaching materials. And that wasn't the case with an article that was previously just free to read. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about licenses, but you know, given that this is an introduction, it's probably too much to go into. Okay, I'm going to keep going. All right, so I, I've been thinking a lot about how open access has developed, and I think there are three ages of OA, and I've, I've been working in open access for a horribly long time. I actually, uh, background originally was I was a doctor, then I was a scientist, and my first job in publishing was at The Lancet um, in 1999, and I moved to the Public Library of Science PLOS in 2003, just after they'd started their um, PLOS Biology, which is their first journal. And I got, this is my, I got my job because I rang them up and actually I said, are you planning to start a medical journal? And they said, oh yeah, we are actually. And so, yeah, I kind of got the job by <laughs> asking the question. Um, and I, I think back in 2003, we were all really innocent about this. We all thought this is really easy. You know, we've got the internet, you know, everybody thinks that open access and stuff, it free, it's good and free to read. This should be really easy. And this was actually, um, uh, again, this is what's behind the Budapest Open Access Initiative, uh, set this all out. And in fact, it's a great document to read. It, there's nothing really new anymore. This was, all set, this was all set out back in 2003. And they said, we've got this old tradition and a new technology. The old tradition of sharing, the new tradition is that we can do it on the internet. So, but the age of innocence was also this. So back in 2003, the House of Commons in the UK did a um, inquiry into open access. So 2003, that was a long time ago. Um, and they, and this was um, actually the sentence at the bottom. If you're a librarian, you'll be looking wryly at this because <laughs> this is what the Public Library of Science put in as part of their submission. They said, it's not going to involve new expenses and it won't place a financial burden on individual researchers in this sort. And this is all going to be terribly easy to do. I know we must have been off, off our heads, actually. Anyway, yeah, so that was till 2003, which is a pretty short period of time. So I think the next phase was this, which was, um, was trench warfare. And honestly, I think that we wasted, we as in the entire publishing community, aided and abetted or obstructed by some of the larger publishers with, with fighting over what we really mean by open access and I actually this again is all this is interestingly also from that submission back in 2003 but this was uh, guess what is from one of the big publishers and you can probably guess which one it was um, and and they've been saying pretty much the same thing for you know 15 years and it's been really damaging now I got into open access actually the reason that I left the Lancet to join the Public Library of Science is because I believe passionately that open access is a public good but the truth is, it's a more complicated argument than that. And if you talk to a lot of academics about it, that's all great and a nice idea. But if your world is completely tied up with the incentives that are, um, you're required to, the journals that you're required to publish in um, are not open access, it's just not possible for you to support it. And I think that we were, we were innocent in the publishers, open access publishers thought we could change things quickly. Um, what we didn't realize was the pushback that we were going to get and the, how complicated this was going to be. In fact, I heard a great term a couple of weeks ago, which is that I have of, often think of this as a wicked problem. So a wicked problem is one that, you know, you pull one string and actually something else, it affects something else. And, you know, you might try and, for example, make something better by um, changing something, but actually make something else worse over here. And so, you know, predatory journals are an interesting example of that. For example, if you say that everything is going to be open, but you have a publishing model which rewards publication, uh, payment for publication, then you set up a business model that can be highly problematic. Um, I've, there's this concept of a super wicked problem. So a super wicked problem, I've the bad news is we're kind of into that, which is that it's a, it's a wicked problem that um, is really urgent and also one that nobody wants to own. So an example of that is climate change. 
which is that nobody really th- knows whose job it is to fix it probably and it's really urgent i don't not think and i i am beginning to think that the issue of access to the scholarly publishing literature is kind of like that but anyway so i think we're in a we're in a bit of a more optimistic phase now um which is that um and this is this is actually from the open access 2020 movement this which started back in 2015 which is led by the max planck institute in um in germany and they said our vision is to finally and rapidly achieve the benefits of open information environment conceived 15 years ago so it was an acceptance of the fact that this is hard that we've kind of made some progress but not enough at that point only 30 percent of the literature was fully open access it's now getting it's edging towards 40 probably but it's certainly not the majority still um, and there's an understanding we need it we need sort of bigger changes okay so I'm not going to walk through all of this I'm happy to share this afterwards I created a timeline a little while ago just to think about um, this visually on the right hand side what you can see um, this is what's been happening in Australasia and on the left and that's the the blue dots um, and in the right right hand side are the red dots and that's global things that have been happening globally what I would like to just point out is that first off we've been thinking about this for a long time so back in 1991 the physicists started archive.org and they've been sharing their work on on archive ever since then um, and things like Cielo which is the open access initiative in Latin America was also going in 1997 but Australia has been going for a long time as well so ANU established the first ePrint repository in a uni- Australian university back in 2001 and QUT actually had the world's first open access policy for a repository back in 2003 so very early stuff has been going on in Australia um, obviously this is by no means comprehensive um, one thing I would just say is that my feeling is that we, we've slightly stalled somewhat in Australia and New Zealand over the past few years, whilst a lot of the initiatives most recently have been driven primarily from Europe. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, but it also means that we're quite in a good position now, I think, to um, sort of get on board and understand what's happening. And one of the things that I talk about with my group is that we need to look at what's happened elsewhere and understand what worked and what didn't. And one, one sort of perfect example of that, I think, is the UK Finch report back in 2012, which recommended that the UK take a primarily gold open access approach to um, gold approach to open access, so publishing in, a, in APC funded art journals, which led to another unintended consequence, hybrid journals becoming a really, really huge issue and almost financially potentially bankrupting the whole system. Um, so, so we can look and say, well, that's not a good model to take. Um, things like um, FAIR, the development of principles, are also a exa- nice example of something that's happened, and I'll come on to that, what that is in a minute, um, an example of something we can adopt and, and use. Okay, so this is what's happened in Australasia. So um, you can tell I was having fun with, um, you can also tell why I need a graphics person because these are, these are kind of pretty, uh, not, as, not as nice as I'd like them to be. But I would just say there is a real arc of things that is ha- happening that's quite interesting. And I'll talk a little bit about them. I'm just going to move the, sorry. Sorry? Should I just minimize it? Oh. Okay, I'll pop, pop that down there. All right. Okay, so... From the ANU repository right at the bottom through QUT's OA policy through to a whole range of things that have really been ramping up in the last couple of years. Um, call the Univer- Council of Australian University Librarians have taken the lead recently in what they call their fair and open access to knowledge program and that's been really important so it talks about um, issues to do with like licensing but also has been looking at for example a review of the repository structure within Australia which is in real need of um, um, better understanding. The Australian government developed a program for university repositories back in 2007, 2008, the ASHA program. And really there's been no substantial funding since that time. And that is a problem. The lack of infrastructure in this area is really a key issue. Um, Just the things that are actually government related are here in black. And I'll talk a little bit about them as we go for. But a key one that I will come back to as well is the issue around quality 
there is a lot going on around the need for better quality in research. This is not just an Australian thing, it's also um, a, a global thing. And increasingly, there's an understanding that if you, want to pub, if you want to do high quality research, if you want to support high quality research, openness is really key to that. And so any universities that are aiming to make that a priority for them need to be thinking about what they're doing in open scholarship more generally. So um, just to talk about policies a little bit, um, uh, QUT was the first in 2003. If you're interested in looking at that, uh, there's a group, there's a site called Raw Map that maps it. It's not co completely comprehensive. It relies on some in input from institutions themselves. But you can see that this is an increasing trend. So again, for any universities that are thinking whether or not they should be moving in that direction, it's highly likely that particularly researchers at some point in their career will have been exposed to an open access policy and there are good models out there to actually develop them. So for example, Harvard ha and the one at QUT is based on the one the model po open access policy at Harvard, but there are also ones that are actually based more around um, publishing in journals and that is fine. And we've, we've, we've had conversations with individual institutions about what they think works best for them. Some of it comes down to what amount of money you are able to invest in it. But there's a lots, lots of good places to look at. Okay, so coming on to um, what's, what's happening regionally. So I'm sorry, this again, it's all a bit um, acronym driven and logo driven. Um, when I first actually started in this job, I did actually draw up a spreadsheet of everyone who's doing something to do with open. And it, went, it was really long. It's about 40 or 50, 40 or 50 uh, organizations all of whom felt they had some sort of um, interest in this area, some of, some of which were more active than others. The ones I would highlight that I think have come on board most recently or, and, that are, and or are particularly important. So the funders are obviously really, really important here. So the ARC, the NH and MRC are really critical. Um, the Australian government has a role and I'll talk a little bit about how that's moved on. Um, well, hasn't moved on, how we'd like it to move on. Um, in, in, in a bit. But there are also related organisations such as the Australian um, uh, Research Data Commons, which is this new organisation that's been formed out of the Australian National Data Service. Why is that really important? They're, they're, they're really important because their work around data is really critical. So a lot of people feel that it's become easier to talk about open data than it has to be to talk about open access because open data has an immediate um, obvious impact whereas open and and can only have a good provided it's managed well and that has been a focus of ARDC. Open access to publications because of the commercial interests associated with it is much more complicated and uh, we've found that you know it's not it's often easier to talk to people about open data open scholarship rather than open access just per se. Um, the other thing about ARDC is uh, we look at them slightly jealously because they have lots of funding and we think that that would be jolly nice to be seen in other areas of open scholarship um, and one, that's one of the, the, um, the sort of arguments we're trying to make to the government. So where are we with open access? Um, <clears throat> so probably the, the most useful figure at the moment to pull out is the one that um, came out of the era last year and it's probably pretty reliable. If anything, it's probably a slight overestimate because it's self-reported. So all institutions that um, were asked to say what proportion of the um, outputs that they report that they reported for era were open access and that was defined, it was actually defined quite generously. So it didn't have to require a license actually this time. It actually only had to be freely available either within a repository or at a journal. And it was only 32%. And that's pretty low, I've got to say. If you look at books, it went down to 8%. So if you think, so this is, this is absolutely an upper estimate of what's freely available. And I think find that slightly alarming. Um, just to I'll, I'll, the, to give you some context of what the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative is, this is a group at Curtin that's um, led by um, Cameron Nayland and Lucy Montgomery. So Cameron Nayland used to work at PLOS. He's um, been working in sort of this area for quite some time. And Lucy Montgomery was one of the people behind Knowledge Unlatched. Um, and they are doing a, a job of work to, to basically scrape all of the open access um, data uh, on what, what's open access globally. And it's a huge, huge data crunching exercise. Um, and they reckon that for Australia, it's about 36% at the moment, 
34% for New Zealand. Um, the unpaywall analysis, which I'll come on to in a bit, is unpaywall. Do, do people know what unpaywall is? Okay, so unpaywall is a great way to get free access to open access uh, research. So there are illegal methods, and I'm not going to talk about that. Well, I can, we can talk about them in the um, in, in discussion if you want, but I would just say I absolutely think they there are many, many problems with going to things illegally, apart from the fact that, you know, it's, you know, it's not the, a long-term solution. But if you want legal access, unpaywall is the way to get access to it. And it is turning into a massive, massive source of information for people that are working in this area. Okay, so key things regionally. Um, the reason I'm putting this up is because I just want to give you a sense of what I think where the direction of things are going. So first off, um, I've talked a bit about what CORE has been up to. So they've done work on an open scholarship statement. Have you, have you seen the open scholarship statement, Blanca? Yes. Yes. So it's, um, it's modelled on one that came out of Europe, came out of Liru. I was part of the group that developed it. Um, it's very action orientated and it also commits CORE and its members to uh, both implement and, and review. And one of the one key thing, for example, is to make sure that you have appointed somebody within your institution whose job it is to work on open scholarship to make it a priority. And that was a recommendation that came out of and somebody senior, because somebody who can actually influence, you know, upwards and, and downwards. Because that was a key thing that came out of Liru. And it's one of the key features that I'm seeing happening globally is that if you don't have, if you don't situate this quite high up within a university or institution it just becomes nobody's job to do and it uh, simply doesn't happen so that um, there's going to be a job of work publicizing that over the next few months um, a very important piece of work was on article processing charges and understanding costs within australia and uh, that was presented at the um, uh, iatl meeting recently and will be published we hope um, in the not too distant future. It's currently with call for them to think about what they want to do with it. And then we did a big piece of work on review of repositories. And that, that work is still being discussed, but one of the things that you won't be surprised to, to know about is that we need to be really making sure that Australian repositories of which every university has one are fully interoperable globally. And that isn't the case at this point, And that requires investment as well. I talked about ARDC. Um, I will talk about, so um, a big thing that happened was the Australian House of Representatives um, made a recommendation around open scholarship. So this builds on a, a bit of work that we did with them and also builds on a previous piece of work that happened back in 2016. So in 2016, the Productivity Commission um, did, well, did two reports, one on data, but one on intellectual property. And somewhat to everyone's surprise, they came out with a, um, a, a recommendation that Australia there be a national and states open access policy which we were kind of like oh where did that come from because <laughs> we we actually didn't put a, a uh, didn't put a um, submission into that particular uh, recommendation um, anyway that was great 2017 the Australian government accepted that recommendation and here we are in 2019 and they haven't done anything about it so in 2018, we thought we'd try again. So this House of Representatives Committee had an inquiry into funding. Um, most of the people and institutions that gave evidence to it um, decided, talked about funding. And we thought, oh, well, we'll talk about open access because that's what we want to talk about. Um, so we put, one we put one submission into them. I got called to give evidence in front of them. They asked for a second submission and we and they said, well, what do you want? And we said, we think we need a national approach, a national strategic approach in Australia to open scholarship and it needs to be funded and this is what it might look like and this is what the first few years of its work might look like. And they said, can you write that? So we said, yes, <laughs> and we wrote it and they it adopted it as their recommendation 12. It pretty much you know, took what we put, which is fantastic. Of course, then the government fell over. So that was 2018. Um, they have six months, governments have six months to respond to this type of initiative. Um, and then, of course, we've had an election in that time. And I'm learning a lot about the political cycles that <laughs> dictate how things happen. Um, and what we are now hoping is that this will be picked up by the new government. We well, you know, we'd have worked with any of the parties that came in, but um, this government has indicated that this is at least is on their very, very long list. I don't know whether it's on their short list to, re to revisit the recommend all the recommendations of this committee. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, I'll just repeat the question. So the uh, question was, we don't have anybody at ANU. We also don't have anybody at quite a lot of, lot of other institutions. And I, what I would just say is that it's not because we don't try and work with them. And I do have people that I work with somewhat, but I would love to talk to you about that separately. Yes. That, 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 yes, we're very aware of that. I mean, I've had people say to us, if only you were based in Canberra, <laughs> you'd be able to do X, Y, and Z. But you know, the fact of the matter is that not every, most universities aren't. I'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah, thank you. It is a really key issue. Sometimes people are not part of our group for re, well, or any group. You know what it's like, any grouping of organizations, people are there for reasons that multiple there or not for multiple reasons. So um, yeah, but we're happy to talk with anyone. Yeah, thank you. So we are, we are now um, uh, hoping that we'll work with the government in the next iteration to actually try and move this forward because we've, why we think we need a national approach is that because there's a lot going on here, but it's not coordinated. And that is really highly problematic. And it's particularly problematic when it comes to funding, because if funding is not strategically directed, then you can end up you know, putting a lot of money into something that actually won't have big bang for your bucks. Whereas if you do it strategically, you can actually make good decisions. So we'd like to see that. And just to say that is actually what is happening in, in New Zealand at the moment. They are, Consul is, organ, is developing, Consul, which is the uh, New, uh, um, Council of New Zealand University Librarians, is also go, is going through a process themselves to develop a, a, an approach there, which hopefully will come up with something national. And that's great. And I think that really shows that it's, e well, actually what it also shows is it's easier to coordinate eight universities than 40 universities. Okay, so what's going to be a big issue regionally? Um, I'm, going to try, I'm going to finish before the hour so we can get to questions. So I'll put these all up. So I just want to say that this thing about the only 32%, I think is going to be a big deal. Um, and I would just say to anyone that is, you know, has NHMRC or ARC funding, I would really encourage you to make sure that you're in compliance with that. Um, they, it, they don't actually um, require compliance at this point you it's it's um they say that they if you don't comply they will ask you for a reason why but clearly since only 32 percent of people are complying lots of people aren't i think it is quite likely that they will look closely and under and think about what they can do to increase compliance and you know i don't know whether this is on their agenda but you know for example in in europe there are funders that withhold a proportion of funding if you don't make all your work open you you, you don't want to be in that position so that's just a heads up, really. Talked about the federal election. I'm going to talk about the focus on research quality because I think that is a really key issue. And then the other key issue is around costs on, um, for open access and traditional publishing. And then, okay, what else is, what else, what's going on globally? So I'll talk about Plan S is a really big deal. Um, that's going to, I'm going to, I'll talk about what that is in a moment. Has anyone, everyone heard of Plan S? Ah, okay, all right, you're in for some fun. <laughs> Um, there's going to be a lot happening with new models. There's a lot happening with the publishing economy. So it's taking a while slow. I'm going to talk about the bigger picture, talk about uh, the open ecosystem, and then I'm going to talk about integrity. So um, I'm realizing I'm probably running out of time here. Okay, so what is Plan S? Plan S is a move by a group of European funders uh, called Coalition S, um, which uh, essentially to require immediate free access with a Creative Commons license to work that is f they fund. Um, initially, they were going to require this by 2020. Um, starting in 2020, they pushed it back to 2021. Um, this is a really big deal. And the re reason, although this is European and there are no Australian funders as part of it, although the ARC and NH and MRC are looking at it, at it this is a really big deal because this is a big group of funders with, you know, hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars of worth of funding saying we're really fed up with the current system we've been waiting for 13 years for publishers to come up with what we think is acceptable solutions and they just haven't so this is your warning that we want to make this happen um, and there are sufficient there's sufficient political will to drive this so it was driven from the highest levels of the european commission um, the person who originally um, uh, kicked it off has now moved on, but they're about to report, appoint their second coordinator. I'm part of a group that's uh, called one of their ambassadors, which is um, 
which does not mean that I accept this uncritically, I would say, but to say that what we are trying to do is to see what can ha how this can be implemented globally. And what this looks like, there are 10 principles. I won't go through them all, but the most important ones are around the need for a creative commons. So I talked at the beginning, the difference between free and open. Um, that this happens should happen in a multitude of ways. So it is not just open access journals. And if there are article processing charges to be paid, they should be paid by funders and universities, not by individual academics. Because that has been a really key problem recently, is that the burden has fallen on academics and that clearly has to stop. Diversity of models is very important. Um, uh, and then the other one that I'll just pull out is, is number 10, which is around, um, Intrinsic merit, not publication venue. So this is saying we need to move away from things such like the impact factor to monitor um, how the, the quality of research or, you know, goodness help us, the quality of a researcher. You are not defined by your impact factor. And that is a very important initiative that I think will, um, it ties into things that are happening globally elsewhere and will be really important. And this is what it looks like. These are the three routes to compliance. So um, you can publish in an open access journal, an open access platform. And if, if needed, that will be supported by the funders and the funders who are behind this have committed to that. Not, maybe not all immediately, but they will work towards this. The second one is via a repository. So that means you take the author accepted version. So that's the final version before it gets typeset by the journal and you put it into your institutional repository. You put a, um, a, um, a, a creative commons license on it and then the university makes it openly available to everybody. That is, and so for example, every university in Australia already has the mechanism to do that. Maybe not to put the license on, but they have the mechanism with the repository. The key thing here, is around hybrid journals. So should, do people know what hybrid journals are? Shall I just, just quickly to say what they are and what they aren't? So they are essentially journals which are subscription. You can make an individual article open by paying an article processing charge. I'll talk, I'm gonna talk, my next talk is gonna be about how to publish open access and I'm gonna talk, I'll lay it, go into it a bit more. But one thing that we know very clearly is that, for, for, for example, there are a lot of open access journals that don't charge an article processing charge. So most of the ones that are in the directory of open access journals do not have an article processing charge. You will always pay an article processing charge if you go hybrid, and it will always be more expensive. It is than, say, a, a fully open access journal. They are at the high end of article processing charges. And we also do know that actually, this is what, from work done by the Wellcome Trust, that the publishers don't even do that very well. So quite a lot of hybrid articles that the Wellcome Trust used to support, they found that after a period of time, they're not open access anymore, or that they're not even managing to um, get them into, a, they're not actually managing to comply. So their hybrid is problematic and the, these funders want to get rid of them. And the final version is to publish in a subscription journal, which is trying to move towards being fully open access. And that is really the body of work that the publishers have to do to turn subscription journals into open access. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty hard piece of work that needs to happen, but they have, they're getting sufficient notice from these funders that if you want to be able to support publishing, uh, us publishing in your journals, you have to have a move towards to turning it to open access. And so there's a lot of interesting, a lot of activity happening in that area, which is gonna be pretty interesting to watch. Why does this happen? Well, I think this, these are the reasons I think, as I mentioned, I think funders are just really fed up with the fact that publishers have not done anything about this. Um, there's a lot of work on consortia, failing to reach agreement with um, individual publishers, and I can talk about that. Uh, some publishers are actually trying to compromise, which is pretty interesting. In fact, there are some publishers that have really seen this potentially hit their bottom line, and they know they've got to do something for their own viability. So, I think that if you are in the position where you know you're negotiating, this is you're in actually a really good position to be negotiating because the fund publishers want to get agreement, most of them. And also, I, the biggest issue I think is that open access has moved beyond just libraries' problem. It is now a problem for the entire academic community. Um, okay, all right. Other thing, actually, one thing. Just sorry to go on with that. And so, for example, just in Sweden, where there's been a national approach to open scholarship. The lead negotiations in, in Sweden are being done by the chair, the, um, chair of the um, Swedish Rectors Conference. So very high level 
individuals are, are going into the room with publishers. So this means that there's a really coordinated approach that, you know, with libraries providing the expert advice and part of the negotiator, but the top people at universities are saying, this is our problem as a university, and we're going to tackle it as a university as a consortium, as a country. We're not going to just say that this is individual uh, university libraries have to negotiate. And that's really, really been important. Okay, other things that are going on. Um, I always put too much in, I'm really sorry, but I'm happy to come back to it. I want to just flag this. The biggest growth in open access has been in preprints. Is anyone, who's published a preprint here? I have as well. <laughs> good, good experience? Uh, yeah, yes. Which, which, where did you publish? Okay, great. That's great to hear. So the biggest driver in this, as you can see, is BioArchive, which is the green. Um, this, do, this doesn't include all of them, but the other one that is coming very shortly is MedArchive, which is run by the same people that have done BioArchive um, and the BMJ and, uh, and Yale University. So this, this is a massive issue. I had a very funny conversation with a, somebody from one of the funders recently who said, no, 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 nobody's publishing preprints in Australia. It's like, yes, they are. <laughs> oh, yes, they are. Thousands and thousands. And it's becoming really important. And I'll talk in the second session about why that's really good. So I've talked about the publishing economy. This is another big issue. Uh, there's a great tracking thing, if you're interested, which the Spark in, in North America keeps an eye on, all these uh, cancellations that are happening. The biggest one that's happened at the moment is um, Elsevier and University of California are in a complete standoff. Um, it, the reason was that Elsevier made a completely outrageous, uh, you know, kind of came to the table with asking for, I think, 50% more than they were getting to be able to include open access within their agreement. Elsevier said no, uh, sorry, University of California said no, offered a different one. Uh, they negotiated for some time, didn't manage to come to an agreement. There were still conversations happening. And then what happened, which was really interesting, was that the um, Elsevier then started to write to individual editors and academics at the University of California and say, do you realize what your university is doing? And the University of California was completely outraged and said that was basically them trying to undermine the University of California's position. And they broke off all contact and they will not talk to Elsevier at all for six months. And so they've set a whole range of things in place to allow them to get access. Um, and they're currently squirreling away the $11 million a year that they give to Elsevier. And they're going to use it to support open access initiatives or they will use it to support uh, Elsevier if they come back to the table. So really fascinating. Um, everybody's really enjoying that. I have to say, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> um, the other part of it. So the next thing is, um, so just remind you, I'm talking about drivers and why I think this is all happening. Open access is a, is a bigger vision of open scholarship. So when I talk about open access, I try to think about, we're not just talking about articles. Let's remember the data, let's remember the code, and let's remember the fact that it's all linked together. That's really important. And let's remember the diversity of publishing models. So what works for, you know, physicists, are there any physicists here? No. Physicists are usually completely bemused by open access. Like, what are you talking about? We've been doing this for, you know, since 1991. And before that, they were, they were sharing their preprints by, um, uh, you know, by sending, uh, you know, kind of photocopies around. They're completely mystified by this. But, you know, the issues for physicists are very different, for biologists are different, for historians. It's really important that we don't forget that. And often the humanities do feel left out in these conversations. Um, talked about free access and open access but there's also this concept of fair and I would just I, I probably don't have time to go into this too much but it is a really interesting concept that we are now trying to move towards and in fact again in Sweden they've developed a national um, approach and they've adopted um, an approach that we came up with uh, in in Australia which is um, a statement around open scholarship uh, a fair scholarship and we say that if you think about don't think about things just being open think about how you make things open so you make it findable because it has a permanent url or or permanent identifier you make it accessible because it's in a repository or some other place that you can find it uh, uh, reliably interoperable which means we're not talking about pdfs we're talking about data sets or we're talking about um, um, items that you can actually uh, manipulate and reusable comes back to that license again. There are components of this. It's actually less complex for research outputs like articles than it is for um, data, um, but it does require investment. So that's a, a thing to think about. 
I won't go over that. I want, I want to flag infrastructure because this is one of, after, after metadata and uh, FAIR, this is one of my favorite topics, which is that we're not investing enough in open infrastructure. It's a real problem. I'll give you an example. The European Union last year uh, put out a call for their new open access um, uh, publishing platform. Um, and they, in the end, they didn't uh, award it because there was a lot of concern about whether or not it would end up being a closed um, uh, proprietary system. They've just reissued it. And, even, and in this new reissue of their tender, they also don't mention the need for open, uh, open infrastructure. And there's a real worry that if we actually um, move from where we are now, which is most publishing is owned by publishers. We'll move to a system where most infrastructure is owned by publishers or by corporations. And we need to be thinking about community owned infrastructure for openness. So two that I'll just flag, one is um, SCOS, which has actually been supported by a lot of university libra libraries in Australia. I don't know if you and E&E has been part of that. Um, and also this one called Invest in Infrastructure, which I'll encourage you to have a look at. And then incentives is a really big deal. Um, DORA is the Direct Declaration on Research Assessment, and this is, came out of a group um, that's uh, initially driven by a group of, uh, at a cell biology conference to try and get the idea that we move away from journal impact factors. The organization I was at, PLOS, had been, has been doing this for quite some time before that. The impact factor is a really important issue here because it drives behavior. So we know that academics try to get into high impact factor journals because that's rewarded by universities and that in turn feeds into university rankings. There's a real problem with how we incentivize more generally. And uh, we're trying to, one of the things, again, one of the things I'm involved with is an attempt to try and get this adopted more widely in Australia. Um, and then a really key issue is this idea of integrity. And I, I would just say that um, one of the things that happened that was really interesting to me was I went to the World Congress on Research Integrity, which is often about things like, um, uh, you know, how you have sanctions and how you investigate misconduct. And a large focus at this time was around open scholarship. And in fact, Alan Finkel gave a talk at that meeting. He's written on that this earlier this year. And I'm part of a group at the NHMRC, which is looking at research quality across Australia. And one of the key things, the absolutely key things, is about how you make your work more open and how that builds to a more reliable, um, uh, reproducible research literature. And this, I think, is a really key issue. It's, again, it doesn't come without uh, investment but it is really important. And I would just, again, I'd signal that this is going to be a really big focus of the funders over the next few years. So this is what I think we need. Just I'll stop. Um, I sorry, I haven't left too much time, but um, we need the government to get involved. We really need funders to get involved. Libraries need to continue what they've already been doing for an awfully long time, being, you know, promoting open scholarship and jumping in whenever there are opportunities, but also being the, I think, in many ways, the, you know, the key experts for some of the, these initiatives. We need universities to get behind in different incentive structures. And a lot of the conversations at the World Congress were around that. Academics, I would just say, I know lots of academics, you know, you get to, people get tied into their own uh, systems and it can be really hard because, you know, you, you're required to publish in certain places. There is a very diverse infrastructure out there, a diverse publishing ecosystem, I think is pretty interesting. And then I just put it at the bottom, this kind of idea about what should we do with the public? And I know that in New Zealand, they're thinking about that. We don't engage the public in this debate. I think perhaps we should, perhaps in a bit of a, uh, a way that's something we should be thinking about as a, as a sector. All right, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I've talked too long. But anyway, anyway, questions and really happy to hear uh, what people's thoughts are on this. Yes, I'll repeat the question for the, uh, for the thing as well. Yeah, sorry. In Yeah. Okay, so the question was about, um, about um, research metrics and what the alternatives are to the impact factor. Well, it, I think it depends on who you are. So, for example, if you're, a, um, if you're uh, assessing people for promotion, one of the things you can do is say, well, instead of giving us all your papers, you can just give us your top five. 
and not unreasonably you might say to I, I, I mean I, and I know people get lots and lots of things that they have to read but instead of saying to people it's the number of papers you publish just give us the top five and those are the ones that we'll be expecting to assess so then you're looking for something which is quality over quantity so that's the first thing second thing is you could also reward different things so for example um, the NHMRC on its grants um, applications has a page which says how do you make your work open so it has things like you know do you share your data for example do you share your code that could count really critically within uh, you know funding applications that's a really simple thing to do within um, uh, another example is within hiring um, uh, uh, actually in promotion so one university at Macquarie for example they d the, if you if you're going for um, promotion you don't it's not all based on journal metrics or publishing metrics they also include things like you know what what service work do you do what um, are you also part of um, mentoring schemes that kind of thing so you don't just reward one thing which is based on the journal where you publish it's taking a diverse approach it makes it a bit messier but it actually gives a bigger picture of being an academic, I think. So it's a whole range of things. Yeah. Well, and of course, the other thing about the top five thing I would just say is that the first thing people probably do is go off and Google the researcher anyway. So, you know, <laughs> the whole thing can fall down. I mean, some of it's not going to change. It's not going to change overnight, but I think it, it, it will eventually change gradually. To me, I think, I think the most pervasive problem is the ranking system for universities, actually. And um, having come from the UK, where admittedly I didn't work in university sector, I'm just astonished at how fond Australian universities are of their rankings. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it was a real wake up call to me. And literally every day, the Campus Morning Mail, which sends out its, you know, email about what's going on in the state, I think literally every day there's some ranking in it. I mean, I, and, you know, I, I didn't know there were so many rankings. All the universities are terribly fond of them. I think that unless you see the universities move as a sector and say, actually, we're not going to base our, you know, this is not going to be important for us not very much will change in that i think i think it's a really big issue yeah um, yep um i work in Yeah, yeah. So the question was about uh, humanities and why it's being left out of open access discussions well first thing was i say is it isn't but it's a different discussion so the um knowledge on latch which is a very interesting uh, initiative which lucy montgomery started and i mentioned actually came out because of her understanding that you know in humanities the main publishing venue is the monograph and the monograph was kind of <laughs> really the number of the business model for monographs really was not working for, through subscriptions um, and so they developed a whole model which is basically it's, there's a really nice concept that, I've, that um, John Walinski, who works in open access, talks about this idea of subscribing to open. So instead of subscribing to something being closed, you subscribe and make it open. So I would say, for example, um, the, you know, the Guardian is, a, is an example if you do that, which is if people pay, I mean, I subscribe to the, the, the Guardian, but it means everyone can read it. And so the humanities has kind of taken that model to some extent. And so Knowledge Unlatched is supported by uh, universities globally. It's not massively wide scale at this point, um, but it does um, allow a certain proportion of humanities books and monographs to be made open. There are other specialist publishers, such as the Open Library of Humanities. Do you know that one? Which is run by Martin Eve, um, based in the UK. And they've, again, they take a consortial approach. So it's supported by universities and um, other institutions. The APC model, I think, really rarely works for humanities. And that's partly why it's not in the kind of core part of the, a, the discussions around Plan S, for example. But one very explicit um, part of feedback that the Plan S people got was that they had to think about what the model would be for humanities. Um, and one, their neck, one of their next pieces of work will be developing, you know, kind of developing that further. So watch this space, I would say. But there are, there are areas 
which are working, but it's not as, as developed as the as, as science as I would say for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, so the question was about era and open access. Um, I, don't, I don't think that this part, at this point, the thinking is that far advanced. I mean, obviously, they must be thinking about the next one. I mean, actually, one of the interesting things that came out of the, the funding uh, um, inquiry that I mentioned from the House of Representatives was that era was made less frequent <laughs> because of the enormous burden it places on universities to uh, each time. I don't know whether that'll happen or not. Um, I think coming back to this idea of fewer, num fewer papers, um, being sub being submitted, so a limit on the number of papers being submitted. I mean, I know that ERA already has a limit on them, um, and more it's explicit in, um, uh, indication of uh, impact rather than just the journal, uh, you know, rather than just where things are published will be important. I think the chief scientist at this point also, it, he is, I know, very concerned about where the quality of journals um, and whether that affects, you know, what what the effect of that is. But I, I think with regard to openness per se, I think watch this space. I, I, I think that the ARC will toughen up on its OA requirements before that. Um, yeah, I think that's probably what the next step will be. Some, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> I don't think it's on this one. Yeah, I, I, I was going to talk about this later, but okay, let me just talk about this quickly. Because I think that there is this whole question about how we actually move through to open scholarship more generally. So this is, I love this curve. And I, I, this is actually something that Brian Nosek, who's the founder of the Center for Open Science, talks about. Everybody knows this curve about open, you know, early adopters versus late adopters. So what he did was he flipped it on its side. And he talks about what we tend to do, I think, as, you know, particularly universities, is that you develop a policy and you say, well, there it is, there's the policy. Well, the ARC develops a policy and this is what you're going to do and um, all well and good. Um, but we know that that doesn't work. I mean, the ARC and NHMRC have had policies since 2012 and we've got 32% compliance, so something's going wrong. So we need to think about all these other things that are around it. And so I think the driver is going to be, is going to be around research quality because if you can say to them say to an individual or to an institution if you make your research more open by sharing the data that's going to make us more confident of the quality of your research then i think that that and will reward institutions that do it so for example one of the simple things is providing allowing citations to data sets as part of um uh, you know grant funding applications and then all of a sudden people want to do that more often so there are simple things that you can do that both incentivize and improve quality and i think my hope is that what some of the stuff they're going to do but yeah it's it's kind of it's pretty complicated i would say Okay. Okay. So, um, so the question was about how does open open access um, improve quality? So, so I, I think there's a whole range of things that do. So, first off, I used to joke that if you put the great the great thing about open access is if you publish a, an article that's open, you usually know about five minutes later on Twitter if there's something wrong with it because everybody can read it. You know, whereas stuff. Believe me, there's plenty of rubbish published in closed access journals that fortunately nobody's actually ever reading because they can't get to it. Um, so there is this thing of just exposing something makes it more likely to be read. At the very least by, you know, you know not, not just academics, but by, journal by journalists as well. You know, that, I think that's a really key issue. 
The second thing is um, openness by linking to data. Uh, data uh, is really important, and there's you know good evidence to show that if you've got data associated with papers, you know that will it improves the reproducibility of them. It, it's not perfect, but it, it certainly does it to some extent. Absolutely, things like sharing code, that's probably one of the most important. And again, at the moment, for example, I think there's only one open access journal where you can you can share your, uh, your code. Um, I think it's called the Journal of Open, might even be called the Journal of Open Source Code. So, and, and one of the reasons why people have never published their code is because, again, you don't get credit for it, you know. So why would you do it? Why would you put the effort into curating your code, putting it up somewhere nice, if nobody's going to give you any reward for it? So, the, you know, that's, that's kind of um, the final thing that's happening. And I think that um, I'm also a great fan of open peer review, both pre- and post-publication. I know that for some fields it doesn't, it's not work. So I know, for example, law, I think, and other humanities areas, open peer review is problemat problematic. But in the area that I work in, there's really good evidence that if you have open peer review, which is then published, the quality of the reviews goes up and reviewers are more likely to, you know, take care over their reviews. And also you get more of a dialogue with, the, with researchers. So with the people who publish the paper themselves. So I think there's a whole range of things that, that kind of contribute to it. Yep. 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 Okay, so whilst we're doing that, everybody should stand up and stretch because otherwise you'll... Uh... Okay, folks online, you should be seeing the um, uh, publishing OA page. I hope you can. Yes, indeed. Perfect. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye. We'll keep an eye on them. Thank you. Okay, and we'll resume in a couple of seconds. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, we'll kick off again. Um, I've got fewer slides, which is the good, good news. Um, and definitely want to make this a bit more interactive. So first off, who's published, who's published an article? Who publishes? Okay, who's published an open access article? Oh, all oh, right, we've got some conversion to do here. All right, okay, so why, why did you publish open access? Yep. Great. Fantastic. Okay. That's great to hear. Okay, for people that haven't published open access but thought they might, or okay, haven't published open access, any reason why not? Anyone wants to share? I guess I have to just look at the That's that counts, absolutely counts. Yep, that's that's great to me that the print is like Okay. Great. All right, that's that's really good to hear. Anyone anyone else want to share why they did or didn't publish open access? Oh, so frustrating. Yep. Yeah, it's yep. Very frustrating. Right. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, let, hopefully, there's some of the stuff I'll talk about can kind of counter that. But also, if it doesn't, let's let's get to that at the end. So, um, I, I wasn't quite. Sh I knew that I was going to do this back to back. So. There's a tiny amount of things that I've repeated because I wanted to just reinforce them, but also some other stuff which might actually have helped with the previous conversation. But anyway, all right. So, so I, look, I talked about these key, key drivers, just to remind you. Um, we've got big things happening by funders. There's a huge number of new model, models happening. We talked about preprints. There's this concept of open scholarship. So we're not just talking about journals anymore. We're talking about incentives and then openness and quality of research. So all of these are good reasons to be thinking about publishing open access and a good reasons to counter anyone who says, well, oh, I think open access is a passing fad. Open access is not a passing fad, okay? We're not, it's not gonna be simple, there's not gonna be one size fits all, but I can absolutely promise you that, you know, in 10 years time, hopefully a bit earlier than that, with the majority of the research is gonna be open. That doesn't mean everything that we read is gonna be open. I think there is still a role, for example, say, for commentary that you might want to pay to read, you know, we're probably still going to buy subscriptions to, you know, um, you know, journals that you that are kind of, uh, you know, maybe even news and views in nature might turn out to be something people subscribe to because it's actually something they want to buy to read. But for, I'm talking about original research here. It is really important that we think that that you kind of understand that the future is going to be going that way. So again, I've talked about this, which is the open access versus free access. And why, why I'm just belaboring that point is because I just really want to encourage particularly anyone that's an academic in this field to think about if you are making stuff open, uh, think about the licensing ar arrangements that go with it. Um, the most common, the, the one that you should be looking for is the Creative Commons license. There are a range of those within that. There are a range of licenses that you can adopt, which um, include, for example, um, so for example, there are some, there's Creative Commons Zero, which means that something was in the public domain, that anyone can do anything that they like and don't have to attribute it. Creative Commons Attribution, CCBY, is the most common. But then there are things such as Creative Commons BY non-commercial if it's important to you your work isn't done isn't used commercially and that for example is what universities are often using but the most common one is creative commons attribution and that's the one that you should be thinking about um, uh, kind of understanding what why what its importance is and then I've talked about this 
so where where is this all is all is this all going so the way that i think about publishing at the moment is that we there was a time you know actually not that long ago where we published in you know we published our articles in journals um you know when i worked at the lancet we actually you know we had print journals um i actually worked on one section the case reports and we used to literally cut and paste things to fit on the page it was hysterical we had an a4 piece of paper and to cut you know you literally cut it with scissors to you know fit it on properly it was com completely bizarre um to, to where we are now which is a really living ecosystem so we have everything we have openness at every stage of the research but we also have lots of different ways of actually um kind of doing of lots of tools that allow us to make research living so things like it's now increasingly common to have protocol registration so if, is anyone here a anyone working clinical trials no no so well if you clinical trials um have now been the requirement for re registering clinical trials has now been around for oh god i mean early 2000s probably almost 20 years now so if you're doing a clinical trial and you don't register it um uh, at the time before your first participant is included you you'll know, you may well never be able to publish that paper so it's a fundamental principle of clinical trials and it's really important because it also uh, is part of a whole thread of publications that starts at the registration and goes through to the final published research. Um, registered response, sorry that's a typo, it should be OSF. The, um, so there's essentially a, another whole uh, range of work which is close to uh, protocol registration but is also but is sort of in in the more basic sciences which is that you register your, somewhat your idea or your original suggestion for research um, and then what happens is that the that that um, idea itself is peer-reviewed rather than the final published research and so what you're aiming to do there is to have research that is um, well designed and can get published regardless of the results it comes out with. So that's a pretty innovative idea, and one that particularly in psychology is, is beginning to um, take off. We've talked about preprints, so uh, archive and bioarchive are really important, and I showed earlier that that's massively increasing in number. One of the interesting things I think about preprints and why I think it's been so popular is because it's really easy to do. You know, unlike journals where you know you often have to jump through quite a lot of hoops to submit your papers bioarchive is is pretty simple and some of the others you know some of the others actually are even simpler but there is a there, there, despite the fact there's a process behind them to make sure that you don't get put rubbish up it is certainly much easier than uh, than publishing a full article yeah Yep. Yep. So, so, so the question is, um, if people, if you have a preprint, is that considered prior publication? So until very recently, I think that would have been the case that everybody would have said that was so. Um, and nowadays it, it's not. So there's an increasing number of um, journals that, ex that actually al a, a more allow, or in fact are even very happy to have um, preprints uh, already on, online at the time of submission to a journal. So, um, what I would say is that when you're doing, when you are, if you're advising an academic who's doing that, or if you're doing it yourself, check the policies of the journal that uh, that are um, that uh, that you're submitting to. There's an organisation called ASAP Bio, which has a whole list of all the policies that are associated with um, uh, journals and their preprints, and uh, actually a range of other things, and that you can click through and see what the policies are. But increasingly now, journals will say it's absolutely fine to have a preprint. You need to let them know, um, and then what happens pre what happens at the time of publication of the article, if it, in the journal itself, is they'll be linking to the preprint, and the preprint will link. Sorry, the preprint will link forward to the journal. So it actually becomes part of this whole thread. Um, so other things that are happening is revisions are, hap are, are kind of more common and the, the, the classic model for this is F1000. So F1000 is a, it's a for-profit um, company. It was actually originally founded by VTech Traz who actually started Biomed Central. And one of the things that um, it has as part of its core principles is that it, the articles kind of start up almost like a preprint. So you put, you put a version online 
um, and it gets reviewed publicly and it also gets reviewed uh, behind the scenes. So people can uh, submit a, a, a review of it online and at the same time reviewers are asked to look at it and once they've actually reviewed it their review also goes online. The reviewers and the responses to it are published next to the paper and then a revision is done. So it's actually very innovative and this is the model that's been adopted by the Wellcome Trust and by the, the Gates Foundation for their in-house funded journals. Um, and it may well be the one that gets adopted by the European Union. It's been really popular. And what we're seeing on that is that you might think, well, that's a place just to put research that's never going to be published. And certainly it's true that one of the things that the Wellcome behind the, one of the reasons the Wellcome set it up was that it really, really wanted research that they knew was sitting, either sitting at journals for years before it got published, or which where researchers had thought, oh, look, it's not that interesting. You know, I can't be bothered to go through the journal peer review process. I just want to get, you know, I'm just not, I'm not going to publish it. Are submitting it to this, to this, to the Gates, uh, to the, to the Wellcome Journal and the Gates Journal, and the research is getting published. But there's also, and there's very good quality stuff happening there. And it, because it's all in public, you can have confidence about whether, you know, the quality of it. So um, you asked the question about how can you tell, you know, whether, how does openness contribute to quality? Well, to some extent, if it's all up there, you know, you, it's much easier to judge, I think. Um, post prints it, I've talked a bit about so that's the, that's uh, probably the it's important if you're uh, managing your research via a repository and then the final thing I would just talk about is post publication peer review um, so you know there's lots of ways of having post publication peer review I mean you know Twitter's post publication peer review whether you like it or not um, but there are, there are more formal sites there used to be a great one um, which was based on the on PubMed um, which has now uh, stopped not no longer supported by the NIH, which is a great shame because that was a fully curated uh, site for post publication peer review. The one that is probably you might be most familiar with is something called PubPeer. Has anyone heard of PubPeer? Have you had any of your papers on PubPeer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have the RD, oh, okay, right. Well, so PubPeer was set up by a group of uh, academics and basically it allows anybody to post a comment on any published paper anonymously, which is just about as good and as bad as you can imagine. So, <laughs> so I personally hate that kind of an anonymity. I think it's really toxic. I, everything I, I do, I sign. Um, you, can, you can sign it, but you can... Oh. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually, so yeah, it's a it's a great point. I think it's true that um, so trolls aren't always anonymous, and they can be really irritating if they're you know if you know who they are. And I've I've got a troll who <laughs> I know who it is. Um, but please don't tweet that. Um, <laughs> Um, but but the, the concept of anonymity is a really co complicated one at the moment, and I think it is something that the whole of academic research is really struggling with. Um, I, I think it actually also comes back to this idea of getting credit, because right now, if PubPeer undoubtedly serves a useful function. There have been really problematic papers that have been found to be fraudulent, that were flagged originally on PubPeer, that ended up the, the subject of institutional investigations and were subsequently retracted. But the people who actually did that get no credit at all for it. In fact, more to the point, they probably get vilified because they're kind of considered troublemakers because they're, re they're um, producing, you know, doing comments that are not, not thought... Oh, okay. I hadn't heard that one before. That's quite an interesting one. Yes. Um, but, but science, as we know, is, you know, it's not necessarily self-correcting and we should be able to take a critical approach to published research. And again, one of the problems that we have with post-publication peer review is because we only get credit for the thing that we publish. And so if somebody challenges it, it can be incredibly uh, confronting for authors. So I'm getting slightly off the topic of open research, but it is a really important one. And I would just say one of the things we teach, we teach a course at QUT about this and we talk about how you should manage um, post-publication peer review. And we say to people, you should try and engage with it if you possibly can and think about, you know, whether it's valuable, but at the same time, you know, be aware that there are methodological terrorists out there. Okay. Um, 
And the, and there's some they 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 do get banned, right? and it also it becomes people it becomes for lots of people an obsession I think and uh, and it comes back again to this issue of research quality which I'll, I'll touch on a bit as well. All right, so I could have filled my screen with things that's happening in 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 um, open research. There's a massive amount going on. Um, I would just I just want to hi highlight a couple of things. So I've talked about um, th things such as bioarchive. Um, as open access. Things that are also really important are things like APO, um, Analysis and Policy Observatory, which is a place for open access to um, the grey literature, policy documents. Um, if you haven't, is, have you come across it in, in your field in history? Uh, it might. No, um, the issue is that your publication, okay. Okay, so it's a, yeah. Um, so it, there, there is a lot going on in this field. And one of the things I've, I find a lot when I talk to groups of academics in, in particular is they often are very aware of what's going in, on in their field, but maybe not so much what's on the periphery. There is a lot going on. And we, and my group does a lot to try and highlight that and as, as do others. And I would just say this is, there's a, there's a lot of experimentation going on. It, sometimes it can be hard because academics, you know, perhaps don't get rewarded for publishing openly but you know again that's the way the field's going so knowledge unlatches this one K KU and open library of humanities for example okay uh, other things all right so just talking straight about open access there are open access options at every stage so this is at every stage this is just a really simple thing and I could have put many um, uh, uh, kind of examples on the left hand side so just thinking quickly about it you've got your you've got your preprint so that's the one that you submit to your publisher bioarchive is probably the best known and most successful of those at this point if you're going to be publishing uh submitting use making things open by your uh your repository it'll be the post print the author accepted manuscript that you'll find that there's a lot of confusion about terms and i yeah it's a real problem actually um particularly when people start using acro acronyms so um i i try to not use acronyms as much as possible and i would absolutely say try and um you know stick with terms that are familiar within your research community and so UNE has a repository and then if you're going to be talking about um uh, articles themselves then you know there are fully open access publishers such as PLOS, but there are many thousands nowadays. So just be aware that if you, you can think about making things open at every stage. And then if I were to put code and um, uh, data into this, then there would be a whole range of other places to go as well. Um, yep. Yes. So that's a really interesting question that I, I could answer for a long time. So the short answer is that universities can assert rights ahead that, um, that trump the publisher's rights. So QUT, for example, has an example of a policy which is basically modeled on the Harvard open access policy, which is where this came from originally. And what it says is that, and it says actually in your contract, so it might, I've, I've got an academic contract at QUT, and what it says in my employment contract is that as part of my employment, I will allow QUT to take a copy of my research, any research that I publish, and put it in the repository with a Creative Commons license. And that's part, of my, that's part of my contract. And that is completely acceptable under Australian law. Now, QUT then grants a non-exclusive right to, for the, to the academic to do anything else they like with it. So you can, you, that has, would it still allows the academic to publish it in a subscription journal, and it doesn't violate the, the agreement with the university, but the university, basically as the, as the copyright holder of the, of the research itself is asserting its right to, to that copy, the author accepted version. And that is completely acceptable under Australian law. Yes, yes.
but because it yeah so this this is the difference between exclusive rights and non-exclusive rights so um if you just take takes if just say um you sign a book publishing contract you're you you might retain you you have the copyright of anything you write until you until you assign it over to somebody else. If you have a book publishing contract, you assign that copyright to the publisher, and it will be an ex and then you also give them the exclusive license. So copyright and a license are two separate things. Actually, I'm looking frantically around to make sure I get this right because I'm not a copyright person. But um, and if it's exclusive, and you'll offer, if you look in the front of a book, for example, it will say exclusive worldwide rights to blah, blah, blah. And that means that nobody can do anything else with it unless the copyright holder explicitly says you can. A non-exclusive right means that you, you retain the right to do something with it yourself, but you don't stop anyone else also doing things with it. So it's the difference between exclusive and non-exclusive. I got this right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so university, and it does depend on the law within a country. So I can tell you at the moment in the UK, there's a conversation going on right now about whether UK universities can do this. And what they would like to be able to do is exactly that. They'd like to be able to retain the right to have host a copy of the author accepted manuscript within their repository, but still allow the academics to publish the final version anywhere they like. And UK copyright law is actually, I believe, somewhat different to Australian copyright law. And it's been quite, quite complex, but Australian copyright law does already allow that but then the universities have to do it so it, it to do it is actually quite complicated because in many cases you know, a lot of in, we know that about half Australian universities already have this within their um, uh, their policies um, and could could do it tomorrow but most a lot of them don't and they would have to do things like also change employment contracts so, which is of course is quite complicated yeah so I don't know what UNE has does anyone <laughs> might want to go and read your copyright, your, your contract, somebody. Okay, yeah. But you don't, you don't have it explicitly that says that the that, that university retains the right to host a copy of it in the repository. Okay. It has to also be part of the employment contract, yeah. I'm, I'm more than happy to share what QUT has because we've, we uh, literally changed our policy last, last year, the policy was that you, um, you had to retain a copy, you had to deposit a copy, but there was no mention of the Creative Commons license. This year, we do have the Creative Commons license in it, um, and, that is, and that, that is what we're beginning to do. We're putting the copies into the repository and applying a Creative Commons license to the author accepted manuscript. And they can still do whatever they like with um, the, the final published version. Okay. All right. So um, I just wanted, I'm going to just go through some things that are kind of common across public publishing, but I'm assuming that we're talking about openness here, which is that, again, talking about, again, lots of people tend to get stuck into particular methods of publishing depending on where, where your, your, your journal is, is going or, or what your, your particular specialty does. I do encourage people to think about what, they're, what, they're, what they need to do. So if, you, if speed is really important to you, if it's really important that you actually, for example, you've got a paper and you think that you might actually get scooped by somebody else, a preprint's a really good idea because it gets a unique identifier so it's got that unique identifier, so it's never going to be um, lost. Um, you'll have a sufficient description of what you did up there, so that if somebody comes after you, comes up afterwards, it's available and you can say, well, actually, we published this on a certain date and I've got the, I've got the, the, I've got the way of proving it. So it, it can be really important in particular um, uh, areas like that. Things like PLOS One, which is you know, one of the mega journals, which selects for, um, it doesn't select for uh, impact, but selects for quality, but just things that should just be rigorous, but they don't have to be highly impactful. One of the whole points behind PLOS One when it was set up was to be able to publish quickly. Um, it hasn't actually, I mean, actually it's hard to do this at high, at high, at high scale, but it is quicker than sort of very selective journals. And obviously things around, you know, what type of peer review you're interested in, 
uh, you know, what type of journal you're looking at. Fund requirements is a really important one, and I'll just flag one thing here in particular. So again, coming back to the Wellcome Trust, which the reason I do that is because they've been a real leader in this area, is that they now have a, they not only have a, a requirement for open access publishing of the final version, but if you're working on, say, something like Ebola or um, an emerging infectious disease, so they're a health funder, you must post preprints of your work. That is a funding requirement, and it's the first funder in the world to require that. I think the Gates will probably do it next. That's a really big deal. And part of that is because what ha we know that research, there's research, for example, that happened around SARS. So remember the SARS epidemic back in 2012? So what people have shown is that most of the, so SARS lasted about six months, six to eight months. Most of the research published on SARS was published after the epidemic. Some, sometimes two years after the epidemic. So it's completely pointless. Well, not pointless, but, you know, it did nothing to help the epidemic stop. And that's really important. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. All right. That, so that's, that's a, a plain language summary. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. 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 And in fact, one of the, um, I, I was at a meeting, the World Congress on Research Integrity, um, some funders actually also give extra money for that kind of activity. So again, have a look at what your funder says, that there may well be more to do that. That's a great point. Okay, so just quick uh, examples of open access, just to really boil it down. The, the, again, you, you'll hear all these terms, I, I hope you're familiar with them, but just in case not. So gold is journal-based open access. I try to call it journal-based rather than gold because I think it is a really, you know, the fewer kind of strange words, meaningless words you can use, the better. Um, Repository-based is called green, um, uh, and I th that is the primary model that's supported within Australia. Um, it's the one that the ARC and the NH and MRC primarily prefer, although they do allow you to spend some of your grant money on article processing charges. And um, this is the repository at UNE. And every university, as I said, in Australia has its own repository. And it's free. That's really important. Okay, It costs the university something to maintain, but it's free to you as an academic. And then the final one is hybrid. And the hybrid one I mentioned earlier has been a really unintended consequence of um, open access um, article processing charges becoming available on a wide scale. Um, it's it, within a journal that's already mostly subscription. Um, you can only make it open there by publishing, by paying an article processing charge. There are no funders that prefer this. The Wellcome Trust, again, used to pay for it. They're about to stop paying for it because they're so fed up with it. Um, and it's always more expensive. And so one of the bits of work that's, that Call has done, which is look around looking at costs of article processing charges, is that we kind of know to some extent what universities are paying if they're paying it through a central fund. We have no idea what's being paid on a hybrid. And the main reason for that is because no university in Australia supports it. So what we're finding is academics are paying it out of, you know, strange funds all over the place that are floating around on their individual credit cards or you know it's utterly bizarre and one of the things that's that's led to what the consequence of that is that these fees have just gone up astronomically because there's absolutely no cost control because nobody is overseeing them so my plea to you here is please don't pay a hybrid fee <laughs> if you need to make your work at open access put it in your repository there's no need to do it a hybrid okay and then i just just to hi just this, people often ask me, why would you publish an open access journal? Actually, often it, it is the best place. I mean, I've run very highly selective journals that are really good journals. And I've also run journals such as um, PLOS One, where it has a particular function because it just wants to get the research out there. It's a really good place for your piece of research. So don't ever think there isn't a place you can publish your research, unless you're in history, in which case I apologize, we need to do better. But the other reason for publishing in an open access journal and, you know, having just said don't pay hybrid fees, uh, there is a business model associated with publishing, you, you know, publishing costs. Um, and many of these journals, particularly smaller ones, are attempting to uh, develop sustainable business models. And, you know, you may well find your society is trying to come up with an OA model, uh, but journal model. And if you think that's important to you, then, you know, publish there. I think that's really important. I've talked about that. 
Okay, so now, now we get on to the bit why it's good for you. So um, the good news is that open access is, is good for all aspects of your research. So first off, it obviously increases page views. I mean, that sounds like it ought to be, you know, you, you think, well, you know, if it's free, people will um, read it more. It is absolutely true. So this was a, um, this was a quite an interesting um, uh, example. It's a sort of natural experiment in one journal with a group of papers that were open access at the top and a group of papers that were not open access at the bottom. And the reason why it's so messy here is because um, over the very short period of time just before the data was cut off, it becomes really hard to, you know, the, the, there's much more variability in the data. But you can see there's a very clear difference between uh, page views and that's shown consistently across all publications. We also think, see things like open access citation advantages. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, another term here, and I really apologize. So there's, um, I've talked about gold, which is in open access journals, green, which is in repositories, hybrid, and then there's this thing called bronze. And I'm really sorry to introduce this new term, but bronze is essentially um, articles that are free to, it's a, research article that's free to access that has no license associated with it. So it might be, for example, a supplement of a journal where they've decided to make it all free, but they haven't put an open access license on it. Or it might be an individual article, you know, for example, uh, sometimes, you know, when there is an outbreak, journal, journals like the New England Journal will put, make everything open, make everything free. Again, that will be bronze. So what it, what's really important about it is it doesn't guarantee uh, openness in perpetuity so it's only free to read but what you can see here is that if all of the papers is um, is one that's the, that's what it's normalized to then um, the highest rate of citations is associated with putting things in a repository which is slightly inter is interesting and slightly weird but it is replicated it's been replicated in lots of um, um, uh, institutions uh, we've done it at our own university we know that other universities have done similar so if you want to get your research read one of the best ways to do it is to make sure it's in your repository the thing about gold open access uh, I'll tell you sorry go on Yep. Yep. That 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 is exactly right. That's exactly right, and that's a very smart use of a repository. That's that's and that's what we'd like. That's one of the reasons why we'd like to see more people putting stuff in repositories you're exactly right and it's probably one of the reasons why gold is at the bottom because a lot of these journals are newer and they haven't got as well established yet and so probably I think that will creep up but at the moment it's I'm not hugely surprised by that but what this does is provide comfort to people to say actually it's worth me doing this it's absolutely worth me doing and it is always better than putting it just in a closed journal always so that's that I've got references for this at the end. Preprints, some really interesting thing that's come out recently. So this was a preprint, so this is kind of meta. A preprint of study of preprints shows that, um, that you'll, you get more attention and you get more citations of the final article. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and then it get the, tr the same is true for data. This came out pretty recently. This was also a preprint, it was on archive. And it shows that there's an increase um, in citations if you link to supporting data. So this was a, a big study, I think it was about half a million papers of papers published in Biomed Central and in PLOS. So big data that now shows there's a consistent advantage to sharing at all stages. Same is true for books. So you get more citations, more downloads, and more online mentions. So this was a study that was done by Springer Nature. So obviously, funded by a publisher they have an interest in showing this kind of thing but at the same time again that's pretty robust and it's certainly true for uh, things such as knowledge on latch they've done really they have really good evidence to show how well the average readership of a, a monograph that's closed is tiny but of a of one that's open will be in in the thousands generally so again it, it goes across disciplines 
We know it's true for media. Um, Sandra's an ex-journalist. <laughs> Journalists love open access. Um, it's really important in particular if they are, I mean, I, I say that I, I often get commented, asked to comment on, on papers. I won't comment on if they're not open access or if I can't read them because, you know, you can't give any type of informed comment and, that, you know, there's a good evidence that they're more likely to be, uh, end up in the press. And then there's this really interesting thing, which is, okay, Wikipedia, who, who's, who, who reads Wikipedia? Come on, you all read it, okay. <laughs> Wikipedia is the most, is the number one search term that comes up if you put pretty much any, ac any academic term into Google, okay. Who's edited Wikipedia? Okay, so, all right, so, so there's two things here. First of all, if your papers are open access, they're much more likely to cited in Wikipedia, and in fact, that may actually change much more dramatically because um, Wikipedia editors are more likely to you know, weed out articles that are not open access. Just look at the readership. So, oh, this has gone. Okay, I've lost a bit of this. All right. <laughs> the median journal paper, there should be another, I don't know why this has gone. Anyway, median journal paper is read 800 times, top 5%, 3,000. Medium Wikipedia page, page 10,000 top Wikipedia page a million per year, okay? So my question to you is if you're not editing Wikipedia, why are you not editing it? Because this is probably the most important source for the general public of absolutely any academic topic at all. And it's getting more reliable than really curated um, articles, uh, encyclopedias. And in fact, Encyclopedia Britannica, for example, has gone out of business, hasn't it? And the, um, the Microsoft, um, uh, um, whatever it was called has also gone out of business it's really important and it's really worthwhile so I would encourage you to think about this and there's a really interesting I think I've lost my reference on this Thomas Sha sorry Thomas Shaffey who's a, a academic at La Trobe um, is really active on Wikipedia in Australia um, and he, we did a, a webinar with him late last year and he talks very eloquently about why academics should be getting more involved in Wikipedia and I'd really encourage you to think about that Okay, final thing that I'm going to stop. So just strategies for publishing. Uh, think, check, submit. Who's heard of think, check, submit? Oh, okay. Uh, you need to know about think, check, submit. So the, I talked a bit at the beginning. There's lots of rubbish journals out there. There's plenty of rubbish subscription journals. There's even, there's a lot of rubbish open access journals. There's also a lot of um, uh, journals, uh, um, um, conferences that are highly problematic. So this applies to that. And this isn't just for authors, this is also for reviewers and editors. So um, one of the, this, is, this was actually a, a, a group of um, editors within uh, publishing came up with this, this plan, this um, kind of strategy. And they were, they were mainly because they ran very reputable journals and they were very frustrated because they were finding people were submitting papers to problematic journals and not understanding why. And sometimes, so there's lots of reasons why people submit to journals. So, you know, hopefully you've done your homework. Hopefully it's a journal that you're, you know about and your colleagues know about. But sometimes it's just because there's an email that comes in your inbox and you think, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I mean, I find this completely mystifying. I mean, it's, to me, it's like saying, you know, well, can I, can I fix your car? If somebody knocks on your door and says, can I fix your car? Or, you know, can I look after your child? You know, it's like, no, no, you can't. So why do you do this with research? And it's completely mystifying. So this is why they come up, came up with this, um, this concept. So it's called Think, Check, Submit. And it's really simple. And the most important one is think. You know, are you submitting your research to a and I've, this is from their website, but I pulled out the bits that I particularly like. So are you submitting your research to a trusted journal? And is it the right journal for your research? And, you know, look, if it's not an open access journal, that's the right journal. That's fine. But make sure you know why you're submitting to it. And some of it is really simple. You know, there's a lot going on. There's lots of good stuff happening. I personally am a real supporter of new emerging models. Um, but we know that those also have to have some provenance behind them. So don't you don't have to be completely suspicious, but you do actually want to know somewhat what's going on. So this is a way to think about it. So the first one is, and I think the most important one is, do you or your colleagues know the journal? And again, I would be completely mystified why people will submit to a journal they've never even heard of or had a conversation with. Um, 
would you put, you know, would your soup, if you're an uh, ECR, if you're, would your supervisor publish there? Would you tell somebody else to publish there? And if the answer to that is no, then you shouldn't be going through it. And there's a whole checklist that they take you through, um, including things like, um, you know, the peer review and such like. But also at the bottom, there's a group of um, industry um, kind of bodies that you kind of, kind of can check against. And one of the important things about this is, although... Uh, one of the things that happens with an open access is often there's a bias against journals from the developing world. And so that's why the two ones at the bottom are really important. So INASP and African Journals Online have their own way of curating uh, good quality journals. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be within a, uh, you know, kind of uh, organization that only works within uh, sort of uh, well-developed countries. Think about what's also appropriate for your, for your community. And there are, there are lots of places that you can go to look. And then again, you know, you should only be submitting if you can answer yes to most of these questions on this. And so you need to be really confident this is going to be good for your career. Now, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you publish, that research gets published in one of these journals. And what can happen if it's really highly problematic is that university will ask for that to be taken out of their repository. And that's a complete catastrophe for any academic because it means that you've published work you can't publish anywhere else and you're not going to get any credit for it. In fact, you may get negative credit for it. So I think, forget about all the open access side of things. This is probably the most important thing to kind of be talking about and making sure that you're, you're doing consistently. Um, and then just finding OA content. I touched on a couple of things. I mentioned this earlier. If you do want to find OA content, Unpaywall is a great resource. It's um, a Chrome plugin. So if you're looking for an article and you've got the DOI, you put, put the, get the plugin in on your browser, you put in the DOI and it will find you the open access copy, whether it's in a journal or whether it's in a repository. And it's fantastic. It's not completely 100% uh, coverage yet, but it's really good. So it will find stuff within Australian repositories. Another way of doing that is on the open access button, which is a kind of similar approach. You can also get a button for that. And those are the references. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to talk more about this. So. Any questions about it? I'd love to know what people's ex experience is with this. In particular with, you know, any problematic journals. Have you had experience with that? Any ways of managing them? One of the things is where, so, so I had some SU students who were working with them. Yep. And I was accepted in my revision. No, no, but I can imagine, you know, go on. I can imagine where it's going. Oh, no, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. Right, right. So I'll just repeat the question. It's about a paper that got accepted in one journal and then was um, shuffled off to a sister journal without the author's consent. No, that is not acceptable at all. I don't know whether legal is, I mean, and, but completely unacceptable ethically from the point of view of the journal. And you're absolutely right to protest against it. Did what happened in the end? It's, okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't blame you. And it, it absolutely should not happen. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I, in this... Yeah. 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 Oh. Right, because that's a long, it's a long running journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, that's completely outrageous. Yeah. Well, um, we'll talk about it separately. But yes, you, 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 can ab you should absolutely protest against that in the strongest possible way. Yeah. No, I hadn't heard that one before. That was, <laughs> that was a new one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I would like to actually, as well as the Think Check Submit and Think Check Attend, which is think about what conferences. I mean, that's even worse because you can shell out a lot of money to go to a conference. There, there are, there, I mean, I don't think there's that many, but I have, I do know people that have been caught up on it. But the other one is that think before you're asked to review. So again, I think all of the same things should apply. And I've, I've certainly been asked to be on, well, editorial boards and review for journals that clearly are, you know, are dodgy. But I think, again, if you're, if you're a more junior researcher, you, you kind of feel slightly, you might feel flattered and you might not do your due diligence. But Again, I think we need to be incredibly careful about those as well. That are good, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree. So that's why you know, like the, f the first one is just think, you know, have you actually talked to somebody about this? You know, have you talked to, and, and, and it worries me that people often haven't had the most basic conversation with say their supervisor or, or a sort of more senior colleague. And, and I say, if in doubt, just don't do it. I mean, why would you? I mean, you know, there's plenty of journals out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, well, we haven't done, but maybe that's a kind of, we, we, it just hasn't been something that we've been able to prioritize. I agree it's a real issue. I think this issue of duplicate journals, there's actually two, two types of duplicate journals I'll talk about. One is that um, there are these fake ones that are clearly fake. There is a thing called a mirror journal. I don't know if you come across mirror journals. So these are a delightful new um, invention by um, particularly Elsevier to try and get around the open access limitations produced by Plan S and other publishers, which is basically, here's a journal that looks exactly like our other journal, except it's fully open access. Um, and you can, you can publish there and be compliant. Same editorial board, same, you know, looks the same. It's just called, you know, I don't know, whatever. Ophthalmology might be the journal, it'd be Ophthalmology X. I mean, literally, the, no, no difference compared to that. So none of those are acceptable to publish. And in fact, the, the um, the mirror journals are ones that the Plan S coalition people have said are, they consider them hybrid and they're not acceptable. So that is, which I think is a really good um, kind of uh, indication. I think with journals like the one you're talking about, the Icelandic one, in the end, those are probably the ones where you want to try and get legal um, recourse. I mean, if they're owned by so societies, they will often try and at least do a sort of cease and desist letter. And that sometimes works. But um, a lot of it can only be done around education. And that's why I, I think that, you know, perhaps within that community, people might know about it, but it would be hard going to the journal itself. The thing about reading, looking at these journals is they often do look scammy. I mean, even, even the ones that are kind of pretty well done, they, don't, they, they, they usually look a bit fishy. So I think it just requires a degree of skepticism looking at them. Mm. And, uh, yeah and google scholar can do that i mean you know they can ma manipulate the research results so that that can happen um yeah i think it, it's it is hard though i mean to get them completely off and particularly when they send you direct emails i think that's really hard the other thing about the direct emails of course is that they can be phishing emails so you know this isn't that's another really good reason not to click on these websites is that they can be you know they can be malicious in other ways um 
and then the other i was just going to quickly touch on the uh, the concept of um of, of blacklists i mean i don't think blacklists are a good idea for lots of reasons firstly because i think they're ne never up to date so there's always a new journal that's a problematic that can comes out secondly the ones that have been compiled are there's off you know their criteria are not really clear and sometimes you know one's so Beale's list was notorious in that he had an absolute bias against journals from the developed world developing world and and said so you know was quite rude about them in a you know in a way that was really inappropriate so it's much better to take a sort of a positive approach and a whitelist approach if you can Or uh, two other things. Sorry, we have some open access bookmarks which are around the place, and we also have badges. And we know everybody loves badges, so come and take a badge. <laughs> and I'll be around at tea. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah,